we might have to do that in the future. Get together and burn some of that old ammo up. There we there go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Since I've got all this time around the house, I'm finding ammunition stuck in cans I hadn't seen in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Necro. Brought to you by Public Safety and Education and the Trigger Pressers Union. And now, your hosts. Hello and welcome to Meet the Pressers. I'm Matt Mallory and my esteemed co-host, Clint Macro, are here to bring you a very special guest. But before we get to our very special guest, I want to tell you a little bit about the show. We talk about shooting, we blow things up, we talk about political activism, a little bit of faith, and a little bit of gear review mixed in. You might get to a little bit of that today as well. So Clint, why don't you take it away and introduce our guest. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest. He is the fastest shooter in the world, I think. Uh, his trigger finger is faster than most, uh, you know, fully automatic firearms that you may find out there. And uh, Jerry Michalak, thank you for coming on the show. It's a great honor to have you here, and I look forward to talking to you over the next 20 minutes or so. Well, thanks for having me. It's, 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 it's my pleasure. I'm ready to go. This episode is brought to you by Mantis. Mantis X helps shooters suck less. Meet the Pressers is sponsored by Next Level Training, Saber Red, Cutting Edge Bullets, the USCCA, McLean Corporation, ASP, Custom Poker Chip Company, Common Sense Self-Defense, and T1 Ammunition. Meet the Pressers is also generously supported by these fine companies, ranges, and our Patreon members. Thank you. What would be the strangest thing that you've seen happen on a range? Wow. Well, <laughs> that's a that's an off the wall question. Uh, I, I I could well one of the strangest things I would say strange, but it, it, it's kind of the concept of competition. Uh, we were shooting a it was a team event. My wife and I, my brother in law, were shooting a, a three person team against a three person team, and we tied several times, <laughs> which is kind of strange. Yeah. And the opposing team asked us for ammunition to shoot against us. <laughs> and my wife agreed, gave him some ammo, we, and actually uh, we tied again and they asked for more ammunition. And on the fourth time, I think it was the fourth or fifth run, they actually beat us. So <laughs> you, got, you got beat with your own ammo. <laughs> you got beat with your own ammo. So I guess that's kind of strange. Well, I, I've seen, uh, unfortunately, I've seen some accidents happen on the range. And probably the, one of the, the biggest accidents that people can avoid is properly unloading your semi-automatic pistol. You know, you see a guy try to capture the round when they when they do the unloading mm -hmm. sequence, and I've seen five of those detonations where it actually detonate into your your hand, your your weak hand, trying to catch the round. Yeah. So of letting the cartridge hit the ground or just whatever, they try to capture it and then it falls off the extractor and it hits the ejector. Yep. Between the you know, and anyway, it's just not good. So I've probably seen five of those. Wow. Okay. That's, That's good to report. I've, I've heard of that happening. I've never witnessed it, but I always advise my students and my instructor candidates, just drop the magazine, cycle that action, let the round hit, make the gun safe, then pick up your stuff. But right. it's, thir it's a 30 cent round. I, I don't want to waste that ammo. <laughs> well, you, you also look really cool. You look cool when you do well, that. Well, that's right? why they do it. They, that's the only reason they do it. <laughs> Until it blows up in your hand and you don't look there's, cool. Uh, there's basically two techniques to, well, there's actually three. One I call showboating, where you eject it and you catch it in the air. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is frowned upon because a lot of guys that do it, when they go to catch it, the muzzle comes up. And yeah, so yes. it's not a good thing. And the other one is you try to grab it before it hits the ground. If you're going to do that, just take your time. I mean, it's not a speed event. Right. Uh, there's no prize. I've never seen a trophy awarded at the end of the match at who's fastest to the holster. <laughs> right. There isn't any, you know. So just take your time, be safe. And the third one is the correct way. Just let it hit the ground. Post it up and then police your ammo and then go about your business. Hey, greetings, everyone. This is Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. You know, once upon a time when I was in Congress, I went on a show called Meet the Press. But I'm more so interested in being with Matt and Clint on Meet the Pressers because they're much more exciting, much more fun, because I can't think of anything better than to be able to ex exercise my Second Amendment right in pressing that trigger. So join me and stay tuned 
with Matt and Clint at Meet the Pressers. Meet the Pressers. Competition is all about cycles and keeping your cycles in, in cycle. Well, consistency breeds success no matter what you're doing, right? It is. You got to have a you got to have a system, you know. Uh, like it's like before I go to a competition, I have a one-page checklist of every item I'm going to need at that match. And I physically put my hand on it. I empty the bag out and I physically so five magazines. Oh, I've got a holster and I've got a belt liner and I've got a gla- uh, pair of shooting glasses and I got my muck. So it's a big one-page checklist just like a uh, a pilot would check his his, his aircraft. Yep. Uh, Pre flight check. Yeah, we've got to have a checklist. Yeah. Yeah, that that sounds a lot like uh, you know, Clint and I instructing and teaching all over the country, same kind of concept. You know, we're gonna go teach like I'm going to Long Island to teach three courses this weekend. And right. I can't just run across. You know, if I'm teaching here at my location where I've got a classroom next yep. in one house right next to my main house, I can luxury forget something because everything's here i can run next door but when i'm driving to long island i got to put hands on it because i don't want to get to long island and have to go to walmart or some other place to to buy something because i need it for the class yeah you got to have a checklist that life is a lot a lot simpler when you have a checklist less hazards less uh downtime especially at a competition where all our our equipment is so specialized you don't have the option of running to a box store and say you know give me a Give me a host before what about you know you're not gonna find it. So you have to have it with you and you have to have a checklist. So so speaking of that, that's kind of a neat a neat way to go down a thought process here. What kind of uh MacGyver duct tape things have you seen be done at the range so that people can continue competing? Well, you you see just about everything, you know. That's the thing about uh having friends at a competition is that you can run to them for parts. If I fly to a competition, usually my my shooting equipment is so maxed out on weight, I don't want to pay extra baggage fee, you know, for pounds overweight. So you have everything down to the minimum, and you go to a match and you say you 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 need something, and then this guy that's where the friendship thing comes in. Mm -hmm. You have guys that drive the competitions, like I have a buddy, he and his wife usually drive, and I actually leave ammunition with him in his trailer. Mm -hmm. That's nice. It's kind of a go-to. He saved me a couple of times. Because there was one time I went to a match, and I, I forgot to bring a round of ammunition. Oh. I, dro- I drove to the event, walked the stages, and that night I got to the hotel room, and I was thinking, oh, no ammo. <laughs> <laughs> so you do 21, 22 events a year. Sometimes you just forget. I had it all by the door, ready to go, and I forgot to put the ammunition into the vehicle. So. There I am. And he was luckily, luckily he had my match long range rifle ammo. So I was able to run to a box store and just buy a ball ammo for the close range stuff. But I did have my five, 600 yard ammo in his trailer, which saved the day for me. But you just can't find what you need at that last moment. So yeah. stuff like that, you, you share, you share equipment and uh, to, tools. You have guys running up to you, man, I, I need a screwdriver. I need a, mm-hmm. uh, whatever. Lock and, tight. Yeah. So you just, <laughs> It's, a, it's, it's kind of a lend lease thing. Everybody has their. <laughs> I'm sure everyone you compete with is a is a formidable adversary. But was there ever someone that you competed against that you thought, "Wow, I don't know if I can beat this person." Well, uh, there's a lot of people like that. Uh, but the competition lasts for several days, so the term I use, you you give them enough rope to hang themselves. You know, <laughs> just you have you have to stay honest every stage. Uh, so the idea of a competition is who shoots the most consistent over a three day or a four day or a two day platform. So the idea is not to give up too much ground on any one stage. You don't have to win every stage to win the match. Mm-hmm. So is there any mind games going on? Do you, do you like, uh, you know, punk people out like, Oh, that gun, man. <laughs> it used to be that way. But yeah. uh, the older you get, you, you, you've got your own cycle and you don't really care what other people do. Fair. And how they shoot. So there, there are guys who, who do not want to see the scores. You know, mm-hmm. they, they don't want to see the score. That puts too much pressure on them. I've shot so many matches, it doesn't matter. If yeah. the guy ahead of me leads me by one point or 100 points, it's just reality. I'm just going to do what, I, what I'm going to do, and that's all I can do. Yeah. I can. Well, that's, that's what you need to do. You can't worry about the shot right. you just shot. you got to worry about the next one coming up, right? Like you, like that, like you said there, the, the most important shot is the one death you're about to take. Hello, folks. It's Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. I train cops in all 50 states. I uh, 
I train every uh, military armed forces, all of our tier one spec ops. Uh, I also train civilian sheepdogs. My book on combat is the definitive reference for those who are going to be in the fight. Issued in the DA Academy, Marshals Academy, Marine Corps Commandants Required Reading. A lot of other books, but one of the ones for your purposes is my book, Sheepdogs. It's for kids. It's about becoming a sheepdog, getting their head right, getting their heart right. It talks a lot about military law enforcement sheepdogs. People said, Dave, I'm at the NRA every year. What about all of us civilian sheepdogs? Well, we wrote the book, Why Mommy Carries a Gun. But for all of you sheepdogs out there, all you magnificent Americans who are, who are pushing the frontiers of freedom, you need to be at Meet the Pressers. I love that name. We're all trigger pressers. We are all pressers. Come meet the pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Macro, awesome Americans in the front lines of freedom. Be there. You'll be glad you did. Meet the Pressers. Your gun is a, a lot of equipment management. You have to be able to uh, sh switch gears really quick on shooting style, but also with three different platforms. Mm -hmm. You have to keep them all running. Uh, a lot of guys are a race driver, but they're not a mechanic. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what happens in three gun. If I have a problem with something, say the rifle is barking or something, and it's not doing what I want it to do, I have to diagnose that piece of equipment really quick for the next stage. So what am I going to do to get this thing running? What's wrong with it? Is it, is it ammunition, magazine, or gas system, or gas rings or what trigger group going out what's what's the problem i got to reboot it and get it back into the game for the next for the next stage so i think three gunners have more knowledge of their equipment than uh than a race guy you might specialize on one platform so and that's where all the pieces and parts come in too because it's hard to carry spare when you're, if you're shooting a pistol match you can bring a you can bring a duplicate pistol but when you're shooting a three gun match and you draw and you had to fly to it you can't really bring a bring a backup for everything. Set of guns. Yeah, you could, but it would cost you an arm and a leg, and a you know. So uh, everything is cost versus uh, <laughs> risk versus reward. Mm -hmm. So you have enough pieces and parts that you think might need, and hopefully never use in your bag, like a crash kit. So you have to know your equipment really good. Yeah, a crash kit. Yeah. Yep. And also temperature changes. You know, that's one thing about competition. We, we take a perfectly fine platform like the AR-15 when it was originally designed, and we mess with it. We change bolts, gas system, mm -hmm. ammunition, uh, spring buffers, and we actually make it so, uh, specif so specified to one uh, ammunition that if it changes temperature or hot or cold. So you kind of learn through the years. Uh, it might not be the most uh, trick piece of equipment, but it has to run all the time. Mm -hmm. So trick usually gets you in trouble. What people don't realize, it, you, you take like the AR-15, when it's, when it's used in its intent, like for a service grade firearm, it's, it's gas ported and sprung and the magazine and everything is tuned to that NATO round, mm -hmm. which is a specific chamber pressure velocity versus, and at the extreme temperature that it's tested at, which is real world. Yeah, so you get a race gun and you, and you jet it and you change the gas system and the springs and the buffers. Now you've tuned it for a very specific ammunition in a very specific temperature range. So it might work good when it's 80 degrees, but when it's uh, 43 degrees in the morning, how is it going to work? Mm -hmm. You have no idea until you find out. That's what competition does. A lot of this really trick stuff. I found out years ago, I was in Phoenix shooting a three gun. We were shooting Superstition Mountain Mystery three gun, and it actually snowed. It was snowing in Phoenix, and, and two of my guns quit in the match. They southern guns? Pardon? Or were they yeah. southern guns? <laughs> yeah, that's, what, uh, that's what kind of opened my eyes. This was years. This was, uh, this was a long time ago, 20 years ago maybe. But it, it really, you know, Louisiana, 100 degrees, you know, 90 degrees, 80 degrees all the time. And all of a sudden, it's snowing, and my gun said, no, I'm not going to play today. <laughs> I made them so good, they're not going to work. So I, you I pampered actually, them. <laughs> you had a bit of a learning curve going on. So I had to change lubrication on the guns. I had to change ammunition. I had to cut springs here and there, just try to get them running. And I, that's part of the deal of when you're going through the learning curve, you think you can buy knowledge. You can buy an upgrade. You can buy a $200 part, and it's going to make you as good as the next guy. In reality, you should have spent that money on ammo, left the gun alone, yeah. <laughs> and better yourself with technique and actual performance. Uh, you can't buy performance. You can only buy well, let me say, you can buy performance only to a certain level, and then it becomes you. 
you have to actually physically spend the time on the range to get yeah. there. No matter how many little pieces and bright, uh, shiny parts you buy. And you know, I heard years ago, an old man told me, he said, you know that fishing lure, when you, when you walk into a, into a bait shop, the fishing lure is made to catch the fishermen and not the fish. <laughs> That's good. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not necessarily what the fish would want, but it looks good to you. So mm. you buy it, you're going to think you're going to, instead of spending time and actually researching the species of fish and the water conditions and the temperature range of when the fish are going to feed, you buy a, a little shiny bait and you go out, you don't catch anything. Hey, I'm Larry Vickers of Vickers Tactical, and this is Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Macro. Meet the Pressers. I don't get to shoot that much because I'm teaching all the time. But one of the last classes I took with another instructor, I went in as his student. And we were trying to get a high precision shot with the pistol. And I extended the gun and pressed the shot and I missed. And he says, what the hell's wrong with you? And I said, clearly my sights are off. <laughs> <laughs> he threw a rock at me. <laughs> you gotta, as you grow as a, as a professional, you have your list of uh, things you can fall back on, like the sun was in my eyes or <laughs> yeah. it was a little rough or the ammunition not grouping well. Or, you got to have all these things so you can, have, you can, you can blank out reality. So I, I understand you practice a lot. Obviously, you know, looking at how well you perform, I think that's a, that's a fair thing to say, getting some trigger time. Do, yeah. you, do you have any other training regimens besides shooting, like, like uh, fitness or diet or anything that you do to prepare yourself for, uh, for a competition? That's a, that's a very broad question. And uh, to be brutally honest, I, uh, as I get older, I do the minimum it takes to do the job. Okay. Uh, you can overtrain a lot of times. Uh, the, the physical part, you have to stay active. If you're going to do a three gun match and it's going to happen, you're going to have to run where well, you're going to have to do some, you're going to have to do some fitness training to mm -hmm. stay at that level. Uh, that's just the reality of the moment there, but training with firearms, it's like right now with everything going on and, uh, and all the matches have been canceled and mm -hmm. so my training has kind of defaulted. I went out and shot this morning, like 350 rounds or something burning up some old ammo, just trying to get the finger back in shape a little bit. But it's really hard to stay in the moment and, and train really hard, not knowing if you're going to get a chance to actually use that investment. Because if, I, if I'm going to shoot strictly a speed match, I'm going to train for what I think is going to be the most beneficial for that. And if you, I, I call it getting hot. You, you, you get a certain group of muscles ready in for a speed match and it doesn't happen, well, you've invested that time and it's not applicable to anything else. Maybe, maybe self-defense or something, but, uh, trying to stay at, at, a, at the ultimate, the ultimate level of, uh, competition for a long period of time is extremely hard on the body. It's just a lot of, a lot of repetition. If you're, if you're, uh, in any sport to stay in that moment of the highest level takes a huge amount of commitment. But to stay at a, at a constant level with a lot of guns is not really hard, but it still takes a lot of maintenance. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the maintenance part, you're always working on the maintenance part. What can I do? So I go out and cycle my guns and I get a feel for what they're doing and what I'm going to do with them. And that's what I shoot for. Uh, but if you really have a, a high level match coming up, then the commitment has to match the level of the match. And then you have to really do the cardio and the flex and the, and uh, endurance training for that, which is hard. That's the hard part of it. <laughs> Ammunition. Do you reload your own ammo? Well, we 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 just we just did a video on uh, uh, reloading somewhat. I, I reload a lot of ammo. Most of my ammunition that I that I train with is going to be a reload of some kind. Nice. Uh, I do have sponsors for ammunition, but it doesn't it doesn't really satisfy everything that I need. And uh, so I do a lot of reloading. But in, in competition. My ammunition will, will be a mixture. If I can tailor their ammunition exactly to what I'll need, it'll probably be a, a, a some kind of a reload. Everybody's got their favorite products in Kung Fu when it comes yep. to cleaning. What's what's your favorite cleaning Kung Fu? Well, uh, my maintenance on my guns is it's kind of like an oil change on a car. Uh, I'm I'm a I'm a maintenance mechanic by training, so lubrication and, and how things interact with one another, uh, the, the the duty cycle of a of a grease on oil so every time i go out and shoot i'll oil whatever i ha i'll have on the range for that for that cycle and i just kind of go by a visual like with an like with an ar-15 
or, or that kind of a platform, I can pretty much feel how it's cycling. And I'll, I'll, I'll never shoot a gun dry. You know, uh, the modern sporting rifle, the AR series, likes to stay wet. Mm -hmm. It's better when it's wet. So I'll, I'll keep, uh, I'm sponsored by Hoppies now, and that's one of their, uh, one of their strong points is there, is there, uh, there are oils that they sell and they and they're, they're clean product, like the Hoppies number nine, that's like historic. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Isn't that I a saw, perfume? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, can you see if they'll make a women's perfume out of that? I think that would sell real well. <laughs> When I was when I was a young man, we had a, a little cleaning kit, and uh, you opened it up. It had the hoppies in it, you know, and you just you just got accustomed to it, and it just it's just a great product line. So I, I kind of go by cycles. If if I'm going to shoot a competition, I'm going to thoroughly clean every firearm that I'm going to take to that match. Okay. I'm fortunate enough to live where I can actually go out of my shop and shoot them into a bullet trap. I never want to shoot a clean gun at a match. Mm -hmm. If I just detailed a, a pistol, say like an M&P uh, long slide nine or whatever, and I just went it from stem to stern, did it, you know, thorough cleaning, I like to step out the door and shoot a couple. I want to make sure I didn't introduce something into that, into that cleaning that the yeah. gun is not functional. Same thing with an AR, you know, you do this, you take it all apart and I detail it. And being a mechanic, my mindset is everything I'm looking at is wrong. Everything is broken. So I have to look at that firing pin and go like, well, that's good. I'm gonna look at the, you know, the bolt and I'm gonna look mm -hmm. at the gas tube and I'm gonna look at it like it's gonna be broke until I say it's good. So, so maintenance during the, during the match, uh, I, I know some uh, like F-class shooters and some like three position small bore guys yeah. that will, unless there's a problem, they'll never clean their bore until they're done with their season. How do you, what's your viewpoint on cleaning the bore itself? I'll usually go a match without touching it, or but I'll uh, on on the rifle. I'll usually I'll usually detail it every every day. I'll give it a little oil. Uh, same thing with the pistol. If it looks like it's been exposed to a lot of grit during the day, I'll take it down and clean it. Uh, it depends on how hard I ran it that day and what conditions. If I got rain or something during the day, I'm going to sure. take everything down. Yeah. Uh, magaz shotgun magazine springs are very susceptible to rust, and everybody. That's one part of the shotgun system. I would have to say most people never think about. Yeah, you know, really important is the magazine on the shotgun. Yeah. Uh, I think they actually design springs to rust. I don't <laughs> <laughs> it's a constant maintenance that you have to take that spring and clean it, wipe the inside of the magazine tube out, make it clean. Uh, so that's one of the, probably the most overlooked aspects of shotgun shooting is the maintenance of the magazine until you get into trouble. And the other thing I found, I'll pass that along to the guys listening, is everybody who makes an extended magazine tube for a shotgun, they put a hole on the end, which is really great when you dump it in a drum, it fills up with sand, and when you, when you pick the muzzle up, all the sand goes right into the tube. <laughs> but there's a perfect way to induce a malfunction on a shotgun is by putting a hole in the end of that magazine cap. <laughs> so all my guns, I plug them, I tape them. That's one of the first things that I'll do is uh, disable that uh, automatic following of when you dump them in a drum you go to pick it up to show clear all that residue or sand or dirt gets down in the magazine and then it's not running so and that's a self-inflicted agony that you don't need <laughs> yeah we we must uh, try to avoid self-inflicted agony whenever we can <laughs> i know you have a, a great deal of sponsorships and you're involved with different pieces of equipment is there anything that you'd like to talk about or or tell us about uh, as far as equipment is concerned well, the uh, Bosberg came out with the uh, the JM Pro 940 shotgun, and they did a lot of enhancements on this product. Uh, it was kind of an evolution of the 930, so a greatly enhanced gas system. Uh, they did a lot on the stock to fit individuals. You can change the length of pull, cast, and drop, uh, but the gas system is what they spent a lot of time on, and that maintenance cycle. We're talking, we were talking about maintenance cycles. Mm -hmm. It's it's probably sixfold. Uh, you can run this gun, you know, fifteen hundred rounds or so without cleaning it. So, mm. and then on a gas gun like that, where it has gas rings in it, it's a it's a vast improvement. So, it's really a fast gun. Is what I've been shooting for the last few years, uh, the nine thirties. Uh, that's one of the things you know. People have a perception of uh, never wanting to work on something. I want to own it, but I don't want to maintain it. And, mm -hmm. Being a maintenance mechanic, I know that's that that's not a realistic view on, on anything. So, but the but the 940s have, have, have is a vast improvement. 
uh, for durability and uh, user friendly. And of course, Vortex Optics, you know, I've shot with them guys for a long period of time and Smith & Wesson, uh, their new 2.0 long slide pistols and stuff uh, with the enhanced texturing and the uh, enhancements they did to the slide release. Uh, it's the evolution of the product, you know, so the more it's out there and the more people use it, you get input, you get intel and you, and you change it and you make it better. So mm -hmm. it all has enhancements. It's just like uh, getting older, you get better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm learning that. Yeah, I'm learning that. <laughs> like a fine wine. Fine wine, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes it's sours, but <laughs> you know, I, I've been shooting now since the early '70s, and I've shot just about every everything with the trigger on it. And what's really amazing is the uh, is how things have evolved. Uh, if you buy a bolt action rifle now, just a, a common you know uh, bottom end rifle. I say bottom end, like you buy at a box store with a scope on it. Just about any of them would shoot an inch now at 100 yards mm -hmm. with factory ammunition. And when I was a young man, you can hardly get any gun to shoot an inch. So the quality of manufacturer, just like uh, with Smith and Wesson when they when they build a revolver now. When I first went to the factory back in the in the in the late 80s, there were like 2,600 people working there, 2,300 or something like that, and they had all these dedicated pieces of equipment. And now they have these huge machining centers and uh, maybe a third of the people, but the quality of the product, uh, the manufacturing tolerances that you can hold when you build something is so precise now that the quality of the product and accuracy you get out of it is so much more advanced than what it was 30, 40 years ago. And if you didn't shoot 30 or 40 years ago, you really can't appreciate the, uh, the evolution of what right. we see now as a, as, as a standard product, uh, just so much better. Of course, you got the old timers. Yeah, in the old days, it's always better back in 1930, but it's really not better. If you look at the, the, the individual product compared to the next one, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Where the variations in manufacturing back in the day were so broad, the plus and minuses that were accepted in a, in a product uh, made it kind of a one of a kind, but it wasn't repeatable. Mm -hmm. With the new um, uh, technology and manufacturing that you can make exactly the same. Well, kind of consist makes, consistency again there right it is you know you look at that you look at car engines now you, you're running on you're running on motor motor oil of a zero twenty zero sixteen back when i was a kid you know 30 weight 40 weight oil was you know what you ran in an, in, in an engine but the manufacturing tolerances are so good now and so consistent that you can run a lot lighter oil and it'll still do the duty of a, of a 40 or, or a 30 weight oil you know so yeah, back in the day, if you got a leak, you just throw some grease in it, and that would help uh, seal it up. That would. You'd be heavier. You know, <laughs> heavy <Yep. up. laughs> But anyway, you know, manufacturing is changing. Everything is getting better. Be the first kid on your block to have your official issue Meet the Pressers logoed gear. Visit the Meet the Pressers merchandise page on BallisticInc.com to get your high-quality, American-made Meet the Pressers shirts and hats. On the political aspect, are there any uh, uh, political organizations or any kind of two-way advocacy that you uh, that you do, or it's dear to your heart? We never trust a politician that doesn't trust you. I think that's that's a good that's good piece good. of advice. Yeah. You know, it's okay. uh, the two things you have to do to control people is limit limit knowledge and limit the access to uh, to a firearm. Only free men will have a gun. If you look at all the dictatorships through the world, through all the generations, the first thing they do is disarm the people and keep them stupid. Well, uh, an educated and armed citizenry is the true fourth check and balance of a constitutional republic yeah. and the true homeland security. That's it, you know, it's always been that way. And, he, and if, if you think anything less, you need to, uh, need to wake up, you know. Uh, just research history just a little bit and it always repeats itself. And that's the two things you have to have is control of knowledge and, and, and uh, firearms or whatever the, the fire, uh, the platform of the day, be it a bow or a sword or whatever. If you control that, you control people. Other than that, why would you trust government that doesn't trust you? Yeah. Yeah. Very well said, sir. Yeah. Saving the children. We have saved the children once again. <laughs> 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 Pretty sad, really. Yeah. We've, got all, the, we've got all the politicians that we voted for. Well, so, I, I hope two positive things that can come out of this COVID crisis is that one, we've got a lot more gun owners out there now that weren't gun owners, say, back in February. Yep. Mm -hmm. We welcome them into the fold. And number two, 
I'd like to think that when people go to the election booth, they remember those, those politicians that limited their rights and liberties and destroyed their businesses and, and yeah. however else they infringed on their personal liberty. So hopefully they'll remember that come election time. You, you, you always remember more when you get stung. Mm. Pain is a great, is a great motivator. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'm a beekeeper, so I know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You got to keep your eyes open, man. Uh, they'll they'll pull the sheet over you in a second. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Got to keep, got to keep your politicians honest. What's what's the best way people can can uh, follow you, stay in touch, check out what you're doing? You can subscribe to our channel. We've got a lot of content coming out, and uh, we hope to we hope to grow it even more in in in, in the upcoming year. So. Well, it's definitely been a been an honor and a pleasure to have you on, sir. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day and. Ex lending us some of your knowledge. Thanks again, Jerry. Stay safe, stay healthy. All right, guys. See you guys. There's a lot of sponsors to make this show possible, like Mantis. Make sure you check them out and give them your business. This episode is brought to you by Mantis. Mantis X helps shooters suck less. Meet the Pressers is sponsored by Next Level Training, Saber Red, Cutting Edge Bullets, the USCCA, McLean Corporation, ASP, Custom Poker Chip Company, Common Sense Self-Defense, and T1 Ammunition. Meet the Pressers is also generously supported by these fine companies, ranges, and our Patreon members. Thank you. Thanks for watching the show. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share, click the little bell, Come on Patreon, help support us that way. Come to one of our classes or host us. We can come to you and do one of our courses at your location. So until next time, adieu. Thank you for watching Meet the Pressers.